Hi everyone, in this video we're going to cover the basics of regression. So this is a lecture style video used for my online class that I'm re-recording so that the uh, most noise you hear is from my animals and not from other people in the classroom. So let's get started. Why should we use even use regression? We've mostly spent the semester talking about ANOVA and um, it seems pretty uh, intuitive to talk about differences between groups. But not all data is structured in that way. And actually everything we've been doing has been regression. So ANOVA is just a fancy case of regression where the, categor the IVs are categorical and the DVs are continuous. Um, and so in that scenario, an ANOVA is a little bit more interpretable where you can talk about group differences because you ran groups. But now, um, maybe we want to predict someone's score. So we want to see how well they're going to do in this class, um, maybe based on the type of student or the program they pick, or um, we want to be able to know like what's, what do we expect them to do. And then regression is actually more flexible than ANOVA because I don't have to stick to this categorical IV continuous DV. Now I can switch that up and do continuous IVs and categorical IVs. We're gonna stick with the continuous DVs right now, but see later for log regression if you're interested in categorical I, uh, DVs. So you can do both. You don't have to pick one or the other. Um, you don't have to pick a favorite child. And so we are allowed to use variables of different types. So our predictors, these are gonna be our independent variables. So we've been talking this very independent dependent framework. Um, but I think sometimes what people miss when they look at ANOVA is that that is still prediction. We're predicting their means based on group. Um, so again, ANOVA is just a fancy regression where our special case of regression where we're looking at group differences, but essentially that's a prediction of how different the groups are. And is that difference greater than zero or different from zero really? Um, but now we're gonna use the term predictor to mean any type of IV. So these sometimes are called X variables, but it's anything that is being used to figure out what might happen to our DV. So we can use categorical, Likert variables, continuous variables, take a pick. Our criterion variables are um, our dependent variables. And so criterion's a word you see more in stats textbooks than you'd see on like actual stats people yapping. Uh, most of the people still talk about this IVs and DVs or X and Y. Um, because of the traditional math framework for this. Uh, but it's really essentially we're trying to predict. So we're using it as a criterion to measure how well our predictors work. And you can kind of think of this as DV or Y. Okay, in this case, uh, this lecture, they need to be continuous, or at least mildly continuous. Uh, if you want to get into categorical dependent variables, go watch some log regression. Okay, so here's an example of a really bad GG plot. <clears throat> where maybe we're using before scores to predict after scores. So you can kind of ignore X and Y right now. What we're really focused on here is the line up here in the middle. So what we often do is create a regression equation to talk about prediction of these scores or how well our X variables predict Y. So really interested in focusing on prediction. You're going to see that word a lot more. Um, and so there's two ways to do this. The first one is why the um, top equation here, and we're gonna go through what each one of these mean here in a second, but you'll see it as y hat with a little hat on the top, or I just wrote out y hat, uh, equals a plus bx. Depending on what type of math background you may or may not have, you might have seen mx plus b, uh, but essentially it's some sort of y intercept over here on a, and some sort of slope for b. So the labels we give these don't matter. We're talking about the y-intercept, um, which is the average score, and then the slope for each predictor. We can also standardize that equation and create y equals beta x, where beta is the standardized slope. And by using a standardized slope, we're actually eliminating the intercept because we force it to be zero. So in a standardized equation, y, the y-intercept is always zero, and so we can use that to compare predictors. Let's go through those one at a time. Okay. So the, the essential point of regression is to create some sort of equation that best explains the relationship between X and Y. So we're trying to figure out if X, our predictors, actually predict our Y. And we use Y as a criterion to determine if our X's work well or not. Okay, so that equation might be Y hat 
equals a, so that's our y-intercept, b1, x1, b2, x2, etc. So this is a multiple regression equation. We have multiple predictors because you don't tend to see simple linear regression because that's correlation. So simple linear regression and correlation are the same thing. Um, their focus is different, but mathematically they're the same number underlying them. And so we're going to really work in a multiple regression framework where we might have multiple IVs predicting our DV. So I think I've used all kinds of silly examples in this class. Um, I spent a lot of time this last semester traveling. Thankfully, I'm on sabbatical this semester, so I'm sitting at my house <laughs> doing these sorts of things. But um, let's say uh, the number of projects that I get done can be x1, and how many naps I get to take can be x2, and y might be my overall level of satisfaction in each day. So I'm going to have some average level of satisfaction that I'm on sabbatical, right? And then I might be able to predict how much getting each project done helps me out, and then how many naps I get to take also helps me out. Or if maybe some of those are negative, so if I take too many naps then I'm cranky, and so there might be some sort of curvilinear relationship there where there's an optimal number of naps. So we can predict lots of different things. Um, if you are, let's say, in our DNAP track, you might be interested in predicting participants' pain levels given different drugs or um, different um, uh, days after a treatment. If you're in our athletic training track, you might be predicted in the time to return to play. So you want that to be close to zero, right, after injury. And you might look at the different exercises that they've done, how many days they've been out, you know, how many times they made it to the training office. Um, and so there's lots of different paths that we can take here when we're predicting um, predicting some sort of dependent variable. Okay. So our A variable sometimes, our A output is sometimes called the constant. It's the y-intercept. I would say I don't see this very often when I look at research in psychology anyway. Um, we've used it before because we had a very specific question about the y-intercept. Um, but essentially it's the average score at which y starts when x is zero. So when all of your predictors are wiped out, what is the average y? And sometimes that makes sense because x can be zero and sometimes that doesn't, where x cannot be zero. So in some, um, let's think if you're using a one to seven Likert, Likert scale, x can't be zero. So why, you know, a doesn't make a lot of sense. So this is the, the y-intercept, right? The point, uh, the average score of y at which x is zero, um, sometimes called the constant. Okay, so it's kind of like, where do people start? B, I'm going to call this little b, is our called our coefficient. So you'll see this as coefficient. Depending on which program that you're using for this course, you might see this listed as um, either coefficient or estimate. Sometimes you'll see it with B. Um, in R, I know it's estimate. And that's the unstandardized slope. The nice thing about the unstandardized slope or using B is that it's in the scale of the data. So this makes interpretation a lot easier. And so the way it works is that for every one point increase in X, you get B, little b, slope increases in Y. So for every one project that I finish, my satisfaction levels go up half a point. Let's say if B was 0.5. And then for every one nap that I take, my satisfaction levels go up one point because snuggling with dogs is always much more fun than working. And so the interpretation of that is, is much easier than a standardized equation. So people like B because the interpretation is easier. Write that down, it's on the quiz. Beta, however, um, is the standardized slope. This is where we force the y-intercept to be zero. And basically we z-score the whole thing. So these are z-scores. Um, there's this common misinterpretation or misunderstanding that beta cannot be bigger than one, and that is a bold-faced lie. Beta is a z-score. It can be much bigger than one. Um, it doesn't tend to be, but it can. So if you see a, uh, a two, it just means that your, your slope is very steep. Okay. When you only have one x, one x variable to one y variable, that beta is equivalent to Pearson's R. And so that's why I said that people don't often do simple linear regression. They're just going to tell you correlation because B 
beta, and r are all the same when you have simple linear regression. If we're working with multiple linear regression, why would you use beta? I just spent some time telling you why b is a good thing. Um, but this third point here is the important one. Since it's standardized, it's a z-score, I can use it to compare to other predictors. So we can use it as a metric to determine which predictor is contributing the most predictive value. So if one beta is 0.5 and another is 0.8, you could say the 0.8 one has a stronger prediction than 0.5. You can test these against each other. We won't cover that in this class um, because it's a little tricky, but essentially beta is kind of an effect size in the sense that it allows me to compare um, two to each other to say which one is stronger. I don't know if I would use the word significant, but I could say that one of them is larger than the other. Especially important if they are on different scales. So I would say finishing projects and NAPs are not quite on the same scale, where they're still one-to-one, -one, but um, the time differential there is pretty high. Um, projects take a lot longer than NAPs. The interpretation of beta is what's tricky, and it's for every one standard deviation increase in X, I get beta standard deviation increases in Y. So for every one standard deviation projects increased, I get, let's say, 1.25 standard deviation project uh, happiness increases. And that just hurts my brain a little bit. So people use B when they want to, oops, sorry. People use B when they want to um, interpret the numbers. People use beta when they want to compare predictors. Um, and so I like to ask that question a lot on quizzes, when to use B, when to use beta. So remember that B is for interpretation because it's in the scale of the data. Beta is better for comparison. Y hat is our predictive value. So it's our, we've actually been talking about this all year in data screening. So hopefully now some of that will start to click where given the number of projects that I finished and the number of NAFs that I took, we're going to have some predicted value of happiness or satisfaction with my day. And if my regression equation is any good, the satisfaction level that I predict will be close to the actual value of satisfaction I wrote for that day. So my score will be close to the actual score. So we always want predicted scores and actual scores to be close because we don't want like last year's election to happen. Um, so if you look at any type of forecasting for the stock market or politics or sports, what you're trying to do is predict how people are gonna do. And so um, you always want your prediction to be close or um, you're not doing very good. There are a lot of effect sizes for regression. And so there are types of correlations. So we spent a lot of time in ANOVA talking about eta, and partial eta. Now we're gonna talk about R more. And remember the eta and R are um, not identical twins, but close. So the formulas for them are very similar, but we're going to introduce some other ones here. So we've got RR, R squared, SR, and PR. So there's a lot of R magic happening in the background that has nothing to do with the program R. Um, I remember I took some sort of um, MOOC class, I think on Coursera, that explained to me that the only reason it's called R is because they were modifying a program called S. So it actually has, <laughs> it's not related to correlations at all, which I found really interesting. Uh, that little story aside, we're going to talk about R now. Okay. And I feel like if you're taking my course, big stars here, this is the quiz stuff that really tricks people up. Okay. So R is the correlation between 1x and 1y. Okay. Big R is the correlation between lots of x's and 1y. And so it's really um, the correlation between y hat, your predicted score, and y. So it's kind of the correlation between the multiple x. So uh, NAPS and um, projects finished and Y. Okay. So the difference between little r and big R is the number of X's. Okay. Big R squared is how much of that DV variance your IVs predict. And so it's kind of our effect size for regression equations. And it's essentially like how much do all these things overlap? So it's the measurement in the middle of all of the X's overlapping with Y. SR, now SR and PR are the confusing ones personally, but semi-partial correlations, which I'm only going to talk about as a comparison point because I don't think they're very interpretable, um, 
is the variance of that one IV over some total variance. So it tells you how much variance that variable accounts for that is not accounted for by something else. So it kind of subtracts out all these other IVs. So if you have things that are correlated with, the, with each other and they overlap, it subtracts out that overlap. And so it's the unique contribution of that one variable to R squared. And so you can think about it as the increase in proportion explained by Y when the, uh, explained in Y, sorry, uh, when that variable is added to the equation. So how much am I adding on by adding that variable? Okay. PR is the more popular one. It's a partial correlation. It's the variance from only that IV, so we're still working with that one IV on top, all over the variance not accounted for, whatever is left over in the DV. And so it tells me how much variance your variable too many close B words here, accounts for when you only look at the variance that you can explain. Okay, So it's the proportion of variance in Y not explained by other predictors. Okay. Contrasted with the proportion of variance in Y um, over the total. So let me give you some Venn diagram formats of these because I think it makes it a little easier to understand. So we've got our DV variance. We're just concerned with the DV variance here. We don't really care about all this rest of this crap. We want to know, can we explain the DV out here? We've got two IVs. Remember, we've been working with projects finished and naps. And so I've labeled each little circle here. as um, And then remember that the total variance here uh, and is this one correct? Okay, good. I fixed these over here. <laughs> For a long time, I had these formulas incorrect. So um, what's happening here is this A, B, C, D is the total DV variance. So we're trying to explain my like happiness score. B and C over here are the happiness score that's contributed by finishing projects. C and D are over here by um, the number of naps. Now you notice that projects finished and naps have a little bit of overlapping variance because uh, it feels like something got accomplished today versus sitting on the couch all day. And so I have to control for the fact that this C is overlapping between the two. Okay. Now we don't want C to overlap a whole lot or that's going to cause a problem which we're going to call suppression where um, essentially your two IVs are so correlated that they're accounting for the same variance. So big R here is B, C, and D, the all of the IVs correlated basically with all of the DV variants. And so I could square that to get the variance accounted for and make this an effect size. So it's all of the IV variants con con compared to all of the DV variants. Okay. Um, R, little r, is just one IV. So it's B and C over A, B, C, D. Okay. So it's the contribution of just IV1 to the DV variance versus R being the contribution of all of both IVs to the DV variance. SR, notice here that SR has the same denominator. So what we change between R and R, so big R and little r, is the numerator. And all we're going to change between R, big R, and SR is the numerator as well. So they're all keeping the same denominator here of total DV variance. So SR is the contribution of that IV to the total amount of variance. So it's just B because C counts for both, so it doesn't count. Like C gets thrown away because it is um, overlapping variance, so it's not unique. So R, SR is really about unique variance to the total amount of variance. PR is an interesting one because the denominator is changing here. So it's still the unique variance, so we got B, but only over the variance that is not a controlled for by something else. So we lose C and D here. So it's how much you're getting, B, over what's left over, A and B, because C and D kind of went away. Okay. Now we could make this complex, more complex by adding more variables, um, but you can also do this for IV2. So R for IV2 is C plus D over A, B, C, D. SR would be D over A, B, C, D. PR would be D over A plus D. Okay. And so you're essentially just here between big R and SR is con taking out the overlapping variance of IV2. Between SR and PR, you're eliminating IV2's variance out of the denominator and not the numerator. So it's kind of removing IV2's variance from either the numerator 
only or the numerator and the denominator. So when we get into regression, we could do, there are multiple types of regression. So this is types of regression, not types of effect sizes, but we could do simple linear regression. We have one X variable and one Y variable. It's called simple because there's only one thing predicting, so one X variable. I could say um, projects finish to happiness. And in that case, beta equals R equals B. Okay. I could do multiple linear regression. And that's where I have multiple uh, IVs. And generally, this is what people do as kind of a more bang for your buck. I can use a mix of different types of variables, continuous, categorical, Likert, et cetera, et cetera. And I can use multiple linear regression to figure out which IVs are the most important. And so that's really where the, the magic happens, is figuring out which IV is the most predictive. Some of them may not be predictive at all. Some of them may be more better than others, but they're both useful. That sort of thing. So a couple of types of multiple linear regression here. So notice the uh, title bar changed. This is not just a separate type of regression. This is a type of MLR. Okay, what we've got a standard are sometimes called simultaneous linear regression. Most people call it simultaneous, but standard is another name for it. And this is throw it at the wall and see what sticks. So all the variables are entered into the equation at the same time. So what that means is that the, there's no steps. Everything just kind of comes in at once. And what that does is it, why it controls for all the variables. So given the number of naps that I've taken, how much does finishing projects contribute to my happiness score? Or given the number of projects that I've finished, how much does each nap contribute? So it's controlling for the, the other IVs. So the interpretation of B now becomes, given these other IVs, what does this one contribute? So that's an SR type of question. Is the addition of this variable um, better than zero? Okay. So does it um, add something to our predictive value? Okay. If you have two highly correlated IVs, the one with the biggest SR gets the variance. Sometimes they get none of the variance. The math on this is um, magic. Uh, essentially what happens is if two IVs are very, very correlated. What will happen is sometimes um, one variable look good and the other variable look bad, even though they're both really correlated with each other. Um, or sometimes neither variable look good, but the model will be significant. And so that's a case for suppression. And so it's really important to run additivity at the beginning of each of these analyses to make sure that your IVs are not super correlated, because otherwise you're wasting your time and power. Another type is hierarchical, which I cannot say or spell, um, or sequential linear regression. This is variance, uh, variables are entered in steps. So we kind of like do step one, model one, model two, model three, and these are steps. This is usually a theory-based design. So I'm gonna control for this thing and then I'm gonna test this next thing. So let me control for naps and then test projects. Let me t control for projects and then test naps. There wouldn't be a good theory there. Um, but you might control for demographic variables and then test some of your other theoretical questions. Okay. Your first IV is basically kind of tested against R or SR. Um, and then in each step, we're kind of testing them against PR. So they get those leftover variance pieces. But essentially, it's controlling for these other variables. What do these variables do? And you might think about sets of IVs instead of like each predictor one at a time. And so this is useful if you say you have several super highly correlated variables and you don't want to eliminate one of them or you, you know, reviewer number two is sticking it to you and you need to and control for both or whatever. Um, this is where you could test them as a set together. And so I could say these two together accounted for X number of variants um, instead of talking about each one separately. I've used this type of thing when we've had um, several very highly correlated scales and we, we, the people in charge didn't want to get rid of them. So we did it this way to um, control for what was happening, which was they were suppressing each other out. And we talked about them together as one giant variable instead of two separate variables um, by using sets. Another type is statistical or stepwise linear regression. And this is where our predictive variable are still entered in steps, hence the name stepwise, 
But instead of being controlled by the researcher, it's essentially controlled by math. And so whichever variable has the highest variance goes in first is one option. Another option is to take out the worst one first. Um, another option is to kind of mix and match those two. So there's forward, backwards, and mix. Mm, I forget what the mixed one is actually called. Um, but, oh, it's called stepwise right here on the bottom of the slide. Derp. Okay. Um, one of the biggest problems with this is like it's an intuitively appealing because it's just like biggest one first. Yeah. But um, at least in psych, we're like a theory based science. And so it seems like cheating. So a lot of people don't like stepwise regression because it um, takes the control of the design and the analysis out of the hands of the researcher. Um, and instead just like is math based. So there are times and places for this, but it needs to have a very clear rationale as to why you aren't doing them in a particular order or you don't have a, a theory reason why you won't, why you're doing them in the way you're doing it. If and so let's get in now to the guts of the analysis. Um, what are we going to do when we run over this regression? Well, first thing we're going to ask ourselves is how good is the equation? Can we actually predict people's scores better than zero? And we're going to use those overall model ANOVA statistics. So the F test has not gone away. We're going to use R squared for effect size. Then after saying if the equation is any good or not, we're going to dig deep in and look at which IVs were the most important, which ones are the most contr are contributing most to the equation. So we're going to use our coefficient statistics, B or beta, and those are associated with T values, and P R squared as our effect size. And that looks suspiciously like ANOVA. So when we did ANOVA, we said, are there significant differences? And then we did post hoc tests and dug into where were those significant differences. And so it's very similar. How good is my equation? And then what is driving that equation? So there are also some special types of multiple linear regression that include mediation and moderation. We have some separate videos on mediation and moderation. And have lots of different styles of the ways to do these because there are lots of ways to do it. Um, so uh, we'll do those kind of in a separate video, but a quick one two on what those are is that mediation is where we're looking at the relationship between some X and Y variable. And by adding this third mediator variable, we're changing X and Y. So I like to call this the third wheel analysis. And it's this idea that when you add that third wheel, the relationship between X and Y changes in some format. And it has stages, I'm gonna call these stages, they're not steps, so it's not a hierarchical regression, but there are like paths that you have to test. So there are stages here um, where we're testing some, and these are traditional Barron and Kinney. And then when you get into the mediation lecture, you can learn more about how this works, but um, there's the C path. We're gonna look at X predicting Y. So um, how much does uh, getting projects done predict Y? Then we'll see about this A path, so where I'm going to use X to predict M. So how much does getting projects done predict naps? Because it might be that the more projects I get done, the more I need a nap because I'm tired. And then we're going to look at M predicting Y. Um, ooh, this is kind of actually wrong. So this is a multiple. Good grief. Okay. So B is actually a multiple regression analysis where we use M to predict Y and we control for X. So B path and C prime are in the same analysis. Um, and so NAPS might predict happiness, controlling for the number of projects I've finished. And then we're gonna go back and look at X predicting Y and see if it's changed. So the C path is really about X predicting Y after controlling for M. So it might be that the number of projects predicts the number of naps I want to take, which predicts happiness. So like one to two to three versus them two together. Okay. So mediation is all about a C and C prime. Are those different given that M is in the equation? Okay. So here's the most fancy picture. I stole this from Dave Kenny's website. Him. Um, and so I want to know if, uh, what did we say was over here? Projects, predicting naps, predicting uh, happiness. If adding this 
nap variable changes the relationship between projects and happiness. Moderation is interactions and regression. So um, people tend to get my mediation and moderation confused. And if you can remember that mediation is like the lawyer term or there's a third party involved, that'll help. Moderation is interactions. So it's using two continuous variables or maybe a continuous and a categorical, but essentially it's an extension of ANOVA in the sense that now I can test two continuous variables and their interactions. So how much um, do uh, NAPs and projects finishing interact to predict why. So maybe I take too many naps and I can't get any projects done. So at a high level of naps and no projects, um, the relationship between projects and happiness is low because too many naps. Okay. And so you'd have to have a good theoretical reason to do one of these over the other. Um, it's not a fishing expedition for let's try interactions. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try mediation. Um, so having a good theory behind a why one would expect this third variable relationship versus an interactive relationship. Now, if I get into data screening, we're gonna add some new rules. Okay. So we're gonna check for accuracy and missing data in much the same way. Outliers, we're gonna add a couple of new little things. Additivity, make sure you're looking at the correlation between the IVs only. If you're looking at the correlation of the IV and the DV, that's kind of the point, so don't mess yourself up there. Um, and we want to make sure that they aren't going to suppress each other out. So we don't want anything that's too highly correlated and we're going to bump that down to 0.7 to avoid suppression effects. We want this to be normal, linear, homogeneic, and homoscedastic. Uh, but now we're using a real regression. Yay! So no fake one. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about how to modify our, analysis, our data screening uh, steps a little bit here to account for the fact that this is actually regression <laughs> instead of fake ANOVA making it happen. So let's get back into outliers. We had done Mahalanovas before or Z-scores for my JASP folks. We're gonna add leverage and cooks here. And you're able to do that in JASP. Um, but leverage is how much influence they have over a slope. So when I hear about leverage, I think about jacking up a car. So how much does a person change the slope of the car? Or how much does one particular day's amount of naps change the relationship, which um, change uh, the nap to happiness relationship here? And so it's how much each individual person, how much influence they have. So if you think about influence in like a politics way, this will help. So how much are they changing people's scores? Um, but mathematically what happens is it looks at the relationship between the slope value with and without that person. And so if the slope is changing a lot without that person versus with that person, something's going on. And so you don't want one person to have an undue effect on your slope. Okay. So the cutoff rule of thumb um, made up by smarter people than me is 2k plus 2 divided by n. What the heck is k? k is the number of predictors in the equation. So the example we've been using this whole time has two predictors, naps and projects. n is the number of people or the number of data points. So um, you would use that to find your cutoff score for what's good less than that and what's bad. Higher than that, these scores tend to be very, very small, like 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, very small numbers here. Okay. Because we're talking about how much the slope is changing. So if the slope was changing one whole point, that would be just like unbelievably a lot. Discrepancy is how far away a data point is from other data points. So some data points can be discrepant. They can be really far away, but they're not really changing the slope. So they're still on the same slope path. But some scores can be discrepant and have a lot of influence on the slope. So Cook's measures um, is another measure of influence, but instead of on the slope, it's um, how much slope and discrepant they are. So Cook's is a combination of how much they're changing the slope plus how far away they are from the data. So if they have no influence on the slope and they're kind of far away, they'll get kind of a small Cook score. Um, but if they are kind of far away and have a lot of influence on the slope, they'll get a big Cook score. Okay. 
The cutoff rule for that one is four divided by degrees of freedom. So that's n minus k minus one. Remember that k is the number of predictors and n is the number of people. But should you keep those parentheses in there? So these values should be very small and they should not be negative, right? So these are gonna be really small positive numbers. So if you're in a negative five, you've forgotten, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Okay, so keep those parentheses on both of them here. All right, so that's the addition of outliers to um, the addition of data screening, a data screening effect. And we'll get into more like what the hell do I do with that once we uh, are working on an actual analysis. But essentially the rule is two strikes you're out. I know baseball it's three, but if you have three different measures, if a person pings on two of them, it's time to kick them out. But you'll see that more in the, anal in the videos where we cover an actual analysis. Another thing to be concerned about, however, is dummy coding. Um, when you use categorical IVs in a regression analysis, you have to make sure that variable is factored in R. And if you're using Jasper Excel, you have to do some fancy con what's called contrast or dummy coding. Um, the nice thing about R is that it'll do it for you. The bad thing about Jasper is that it won't, so you'll have to do it yourself. Um, otherwise, it'll interpret that variable as continuous, which is um, not what you want. Right? So if you're comparing different religions and you can code them one, two, three, four, and you interpret that as one, two, three, four, you've ranked religions, which is not a good idea. So um, if you're using R, whatever variable is coded as the first group, um, which is often alphabetical, is your comparison group, and you essentially get every group compared to that group. If you want all pairwise combinations, you have to recode and run again. Uh, and there'll be a specific video that does this. And then if you're using Jasper Excel, I'll teach you how to do the binary contra uh, dummy coding for this sort of thing, where you create your comparison group and create columns that um, allow you to do pairwise, this sort of pairwise comparison. If so, there'll be separate videos for those two different programs because you have to manually do it for Jasp. All right, so that kind of concludes our like overview of regression, where um, there's some special data analysis, data screening techniques, and then there are lots of different types of regression, and then some special considerations, which is categorical IVs. There'll be separate videos that cover dumb, dummy coded data in regression, simultaneous regression, and hierarchical regression. Um, so you'll want to take a look at all three of those to complete your regression block.